What were the Americans looking for in 1947 in Antarctica? This is a mission with Admiral Byrd. The aliens were alarmed in 1947 when rumors surfaced that the Antarctic base had been in operation since at least 1935, thanks to the efforts of the Brill, the Brill Group, an independent group with huge funds involved in new technologies and the development of revolutionary futuristic aircraft in the shape of disc saucer-shaped UFOs. Microfilms found on a German submarine bound for the southern seas revealed the uh, superiority of the technology that Germany had at that time, stating that they were at least 50 years ahead. And the Americans sent 48 ships, including a submarine, an aircraft carrier, and a ship carrying 200 aircraft, as well as 4,080 soldiers led by Admiral Richard Byrd under the pretext of exploring Antarctica, but who were in fact to find the uh, German base on Antarctica. That was their goal. The official name was Operation High Jump. The mission arrived in the winter of 1946-47 and ended in late February of 1947. Operation High Jump's main public mission was to expand the Little America Research Base in Antarctica. This was according to the U.S. Naval report. Byrd had eight months to complete the mission. But in just eight weeks, he was forced to return with many losses on fighter jets. So what happened? According to information leaked by men of the mission, the U.S. Navy was confronted with a group of real flying saucers. In the air battles that followed the arrival in Antarctica, four planes were destroyed and 12 were lost. And as they were significantly behind the, uh, those that were already there, the American services withdrew the mission. In the official reports that were submitted, the four planes that were destroyed seemed to have quote-unquote technical problems and crashed on icebergs. Admiral Byrd had been given an, an unexpected interview to the Spanish newspaper El Mercurio in Santiago, Chile, March 5, 1947, stating that, quote, Admiral Byrd stated today that it was imperative for the United States to take immediate action against unknown enemies, end quote. The Admiral also said he did not want to scare anyone, but it was a bitter reality that in the event of a new war, the continental United States would have to defend itself from flying objects coming from the pole at incredible speeds. I posted a few days ago, May 17, an article with the quotations from the American General Douglas MacArthur having to do with the sinister forces and interplanetary war with extraterrestrial species that uh, are, are fighting it over our heads. And he said this quite a few times. So uh, this statement by Admiral Byrd having to do with uh, strange forces that are uh, beyond the speed of uh, uh, super, super hyperspeed uh, vehicles um, basically made at the same time when uh, Douglas MacArthur made his statements. So they were going fr from the poles, from the pole at incredible speeds. He's uh, mentioning South Pole here. During the press conference, the Admiral also said that in a rapidly shrinking world, the United States would no longer derive any sense of security from its isolation or geographical distance from the oceans. The Admiral reaffirmed his belief that the entire continent of Antarctica should be closely monitored. Now, let's remember that the only people that are allowed to go there are the ones who have been, been given permits to go there. So the Admiral reaffirms his belief the entire continent should be closely monitored, monitored. And as for Admiral Byrd, when he arrived in the United States, he spent several weeks in the investigative offices. All his documents and diary strangely disappeared while he is said to have ended up in a psychiatric clinic and that his traces then disappeared. Eisenhower then made a statement. He said World War II is not over yet, end quote, and is confirmed by Admiral Byrd's dis disturbing phrase, quote, in the event of a new war, end quote. The last battalions from Hitler were waiting for their golden opportunity, and as early as the 1950s, rumors began circulating among nationalists there, circles that they were convinced that post-war flying drives flying around the world would, were in fact 
uh, German super weapons under development controlled during the Third Reich. It was then, let us not forget, a Roswell incident, 19, July 4th, 1947. Until the late 1970s, they, uh, these riders, those riders claimed that the legendary last battalion, which was intended to preserve post-war Nazi secrets, was in a vast underground paradise in Antarctica. William and Landing, two publishers and writers, report on the revival with facts, stories, and suggestions. Some report that when the Americans failed to strike the German underground base Neuber Schatz Garden in Antarctica, strikes took place in 1958 under the pretext of nuclear tests that were officially known is that 1958 as part of Operation Argus, there were three atmospheric nuclear explosions and the tests were actually in the southern hemisphere between 2,300 and 3,500 kilometers north of Maudland. Of course, others may be the product of unbridled imagination, but no one has denied the catastrophic failure of Operation High Jump and their mission and the testimonies of the crews that they encountered superior flying objects in Antarctica. It concerns the uh, Arctic flight, 1947, February 19, uh, the exploratory flight over the North Pole, Hollow Earth, the diary from uh, Admiral Byrd, Beyond the, the Earth Beyond the Poles. There comes a time when the rationality of man pales on, and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. He said, I am not in a position to reveal the following documents in this writing, maybe they should never see the light of public scrutiny, but I have to my duty, I have to do my duty here so that everyone can read it one day. In a world of greed and exploitation of some great against some against humanity, the truth can no longer be suppressed. Flight log, Arctic base, April um, February 19, 1947, 600 hours, all preparations for our flight to the north have been completed and we are airlifted with a full fuel tank in 610 hours, 620 hours, fuel mix for right engine looks very rich, adjustment made and engine running smoothly. And he goes on to various every 10 minutes or so, um, logging what was going on. 10, 11, uh, 10, uh, 9, 10 hours, magnetic compass and gyroscopes rotate oscillating we are not able to keep control of the instruments. We use a solar compass and everything looks good. Contrast to control seemingly slow in response and have an indication of sluggishness, but no trace of ice. And uh, he goes on every, just about every, uh, then after that, every hour or so. Um, from, he says, from this point, I write the following facts from memory. That's after um, 1145 hours. And he continues to do, they defy a, any imagination and look at cr all crazy if it not, had not happened. The radio operator and I left the boat in a very welcome manner. We then boarded a small platform with no wheel drive. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, we pass over a small mountain, continue to the north as far as we can ascertain. Beyond the mountain range, you can see a valley with a small river or stream that crosses the central part. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and unnatural here. We should be over snow and ice. On the other side, there are large forests on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still rotating. The gyroscope is swinging back and forth. And, um, okay, then he says he sees things that look like uh, at 10.05 hours, I can I change the altitude to 1,400 feet, make a sharp left turn to better look at the valley below. It is green with moss or a tight kind of grass. The light here looks different. I can no longer see the sun. We make another left turn and find some kind of animal visible before us. It looks like an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is unbelievable. However, it is here. Altitude reduction to 1,000 feet and I get binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed they are definitely mammoths. Mention it in the database. 10.30 hours, we meet Green Hill, Green Hills. Um, the wireless does not work. 11.30 hours, countryside below is flatter and more normal. Um, 
and I'll go to 1135 hours, a voice comes straight from our radio in English with a light Scandinavian or German accent. The message says, welcome, Admiral, to our sector. We will land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. I find that the engines of our plane have stopped working. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now making a turn. Mun mun uh, manipulations are useless. Uh, in other words, his aircraft, have, the controls of his aircraft are being manipulated by something, someone else. 1140 hours, another radio message received. We have started the landing process and at times the plane trembles slightly and begins to descend immediately as if, as if caught in a large invisible elevator. The downward movement is negligible and we touch the ground with a small jolt. 1145 hours, I make a hasty last entry to the flight log. Several men approach our plane on foot. They are tall, white, with blonde hair. And in the background is a large glittering city that pulsates with the shades of the colors of the rainbow. I do not know what is going to happen but now, but I do not see any sign of weapons on those approaching. I now hear a voice ordering me in, uh, in my name to open the cargo door. Obey. Admiral Byrd continues, from this point, I write all the facts from memory. They defy any imagination and look all crazy if it had not happened. The radio operator and I left the boat in a very welcoming manner. When then We then boarded a smaller platform with no wheel drive. He took us to the bright city at high speed, and as we approached, the city appears to be made of crystalline material. We soon arrive at a large building that is a species I have never seen before. We are offered a kind of hot drink whose taste I have never tasted before. It's delicious. After about 10 minutes, two of our wonderful hosts show up and let us know that I need to accompany them. I have no choice but to follow. I leave my radio behind and we walk a short distance into something that looks like an elevator. We go down for a few moments. The machine stops and the door rises silently. Where then we proceed to a long corridor limited by rose light that seems to come from the walls themselves. One of the two suggests we stop in front of the large door. There is an inscription on the door that I cannot read. The big door slides silently and I enter. Do not be afraid, Admiral. You are listening to the master. I walk in and my eyes adjust to the beautiful color that seems to fill the space. Then I start to see my environment. What my eyes saw is indeed the most beautiful spectacle of my whole experience. It's indeed very beautiful and wonderful to describe it. I don't think there is a human term that can describe in every detail. My thoughts are heartily interrupted by a warm, rich, melodic voice. Welcome to our area, Admiral. I see a man with refined features and with the marks of years on his face. He's sitting at a long table. It makes sense for me to sit in one of the chairs. After I sit down, he crosses his fingers and laughs. He speaks slowly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are noble and known to the surface world, Admiral. I answer under my breath, yes. The master responds with a smile. You are in Ariani's field, in the inner world of the earth. Your mission should, be not, should not be delayed and we will accompany you safely to the surface for a further distance. But now, Admiral, I'll tell you why you were called here. Our interests begin immediately after the first atomic bombs exploded Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. At that disturbing moment, we sent our flying machines to the surface to explore what your race had done. This, of course, is a thing of the past, but I must continue. You see, we have never intervened in wars of your race, in barbarism, but now you have to be we have to because you have been you have learned to interfere intervene in a specific force that is not intended for man the individual our envoys have already let message left messages to your governments around the world but do not take the the world doesn't take them seriously you have now been chosen to witness the existence of our world you see our culture and science are many thousands of years ahead of your race admiral I interrupted, but why does this have, what does this have to do with me, sir? His eyes penetrated deep into my mind, and after some thought, he replied, your race has reached a path of no return, since there are some among you who will destroy your world rather than leave power as they know it. I shook my head, and the teacher continued, in 1945, and then we write, 
We tried to contact your tribe, but our efforts were met with hostility and our boats were attacked, meaning their crafts. And yes, they are still being pursued with malice and hostility by your fighters. So now I can tell you that a storm is raging in your world, a dark low that will not be exhausted for years. There will be no answer in your hands. There is no security in your science. It will hold until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human beings have been destabilized into a huge mess. Your recent war was just a prelude to what will happen in your race, to your race. We here see it more clearly at each passing hour. You are saying I'm wrong? No, I replied. This happened once before. The Dark Ages came and lasted for more than 500 years. The teacher replied, yes, my child, dark ages will come for your tribe and will cover the earth like a veil, but I believe that some of your tribe will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see in the distance a new world from the ruins of your struggle, looking for the lost and legendary treasures, and you'll be here, my child, safe in our preservation. When that time comes, we will come to the fore and help restore your culture. By then, you may have learned the futility of war and conflict, and after that, some of your cultures and sciences will be returned to your race to start over. You, my child, must return to the surface with this message. With these words, our meeting closes. I stood for a moment like, a, like in a dream, but I knew it was a reality, and for some strange reason, I bent down a little either out of respect or humility. I don't know exactly. Suddenly, I realized again that it, the two hosts who brought me there uh, were by my side again. From here, he was an admiral, they nodded. I turned once more from leaving, looked at the teacher. A gentle smile was etched on his slender and ancient face. Goodbye, my child, he said, and then made a meaningful gesture, a gesture of peace in our meeting that really ended. Quickly, we walked behind the large door of the booth of the teacher's room and entered the elevator. The door slid silently down at the same time we went up. One of the hosts spoke to me again. We should hurry now, Admiral. The teacher wishes you not to delay any longer with your schedule and you should return his message about your race. I did not say anything. All of this was beyond belief and once again my thoughts stopped as we stopped. I entered the room and found myself with my radio again. It had a worried he had a worried expression on his face. As I approached, I said, okay, Howie, all, all right. The two beings nodded to us, waited for a transfer. We brought it, we boarded and soon got back on the plane. The engines idled and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed to be charged with an air of urgency. After the uh, cargo door closed, the aircraft was lifted by the invisible force until we reached 2,700 meters higher. Two of the aircraft were with us for some distance for guidance on the way back. I must state here that the air velocity indicator did not read, but we were moving at a very fast pace. 2015, uh, two, uh, 215 hours, a radio message was coming. We are leaving you now, Admiral. It has completed freedom of, in, of operation. We watched for a moment as the records appeared into the blue sky. The aircraft suddenly felt like it had been caught in a sharp drop for a moment. We quickly regained control. We did not talk for a while. Everyone has the, had their own thoughts. Flight log entries continues. Two twenty hours, we were again over huge areas of ice and snow about 27 minutes from the base. We talk to them and they respond. We, we, we report all number of conditions. The base expert expresses its relief for successful communication. Um, end of registration. Then March 11, 1947, I attended a meeting with staff at the Pentagon. I have fully stated my discovery and the teacher's message. Everything was noted. The president had been informed. I am in custody for several hours, six hours, 39 minutes. I am being interrogated by the top security forces and a medical team. It was a test. I have been brought under strict control by U.S. law and I was instructed to remain silent about what I learned on behalf of humanity. Unbelievable. I was reminded that I was in the military and had to obey orders. Uh, December 30th, 1956, last registration on the law, on his uh, diary. These last years that have passed since 1947 have not been calm. I am now making my final addition to this unique calendar. 
In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept the matter a secret in accordance with its instructions all these years. It's completely contrary to my values and ethos. Now I seem to feel the long night coming, and this secret will not die with me, but the whole truth must and will triumph properly. This may be the only hope for humanity. I have seen the truth, and my spirit has accelerated, and I have been set free. I have done my duty to the monstrous military-industrial complex. Now the big night is approaching, but there will be no end. Just as the long Arctic night ends, the bright sun of truth will come again, and those who are dark will fall into this light. For what I have seen in the country beyond the pole, in the center of the great unknown. This was by uh, Admiral Richard E. Byrd, United States Navy, December 24th, 1956, from uh, the Truth Seekers, and uh, I've translated this from a Greek article. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. I finally support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.